Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and today we're wrapping up our Uniting the North series with episode 6, titled The End of the Yuan. Now, we ended our last episode with the fall of Ye, but before we move on to how the three Yuan children all would die to Cao Cao, we need to do a quick aside for a former Yuan clan advisor, Yin Xu Yu, who had been drunk off his contribution to the victory at Guandu, as it was he who had betrayed Yuan Shao and informed his childhood friend Cao Cao of the location of the supplies at Wu Chao. So following the capture of Ye, there were many feasts that were planned to celebrate their victories, and at these feasts, Xu Yu's arrogance got the better of himself, as he would often approach Cao Cao, and instead of calling him my lord, or using Cao Cao's style name of Meng De, Xu Yu opted for Cao Cao's childhood nickname of A Man, as he would often gloat that they are only here having these feasts because of him. Then one day, while Xu Yu was patrolling the east gates of Ye, he started to brag to all the troops about how the tall clan would have never taken Ye if it wasn't for him. And this ended up being the straw that broke the camel's back, as Cao Cao would soon have Xu Yu arrested, before executing him for his arrogance. Now while this event does not have much to do with our lore series, it felt necessary to bring it up, as Xu Yu did play a crucial role in the Battle of Guandu. So now with that settled, let's return to the conquest of Yuan Tan, who was encamped in Nanpi as his two younger brothers have banded together farther north in the Yu province. And since Yuan Tan has reclaimed his independence from Cao Cao, Cao Cao responded by returning his daughter to him as he went ahead and canceled the marriage arrangement signifying that death was the only way this was going to end. But even though Yuan Tan had only four months to muster up his forces after chasing Yuan Shang out of Zhongshan, he was relatively confident because he had an ace up his sleeve as one of the Wu Huan chieftains from the city of Liu Cheng had promised him 5,000 riders to come to his aid. However, Cao Cao had also heard about this news as he responded by sending General Qian Zhao to Liu Cheng to negotiate with the Wu Huan chieftains. Now, Qian Zhao was a northerner who had previously worked for Yuan Shao and then Yuan Shang as the lieutenant of Wu Huan affairs. Interestingly enough, he was also a teenage friend of Liu Bei. But more importantly, during the siege of Ye, Qian Zhao was in charge of trying to resupply the city. However, as we already learned in our last episode, the supply routes were all cut off and Qian Zhao was forced to flee west to the Bin province where he tried to convince Gao Gan to shelter Yuan Shang inside the Bin province rather than fleeing farther north to Yuan Xi as the mountainous terrains of the Bin province and the many gate passes in the region were easier to defend. But seeing that Ye was about to fall, Gao Gan also started to question his own loyalty to the Yuan clan, as he tried to kill Tian Zhao instead. Luckily, Tian Zhao escaped. But seeing that Yuan Tan had already chased Yuan Shang to Yuan Xi in the Yu province, he decided that joining Cao Cao was probably his only way out. So after escaping from the Bin province, Tian Zhao joined Cao Cao. Now with the news of potential Wu Huan reinforcement, Cao Cao turned to this former lieutenant of the Wuhan affairs and asked him to delay or convince the Wuhan chieftain to end their support of the Yuan clan. But this diplomatic mission ended up a lot harder than anticipated, because at the same time, Gong Sun Kang, who was the administrator of Liao Dong Commandery, recently self-promoted himself to become the governor of his self-created Ping province, as his expansions into modern-day Korea Peninsula expanded his holdings, which encouraged him to send a delegate by the name of Han Zhong to the Wu Huan chieftains as well, to try to convince them to become his vassal instead. Thus, a confused Wu Huan chieftain asked Qian Zhao to explain himself. As first, Yuan Shao had claimed he had the mandate of the emperor and had used it to name me the chieftain and his vassal. Now Cao Cao also claimed he has the mandate of the emperor and also wants to name me as the chieftain and become his vassal. While my neighbor to the east, Gong Sun Kang, is also trying to name me the chieftain and his vassal. So which one of you actually have the mandate? And after a short verbal argument, 
between Tianzhou and Hanzhong. Tianzhou resorted to violence as he ended up throwing Hanzhong down to the ground and placed his blade over Hanzhong's neck as he told him, "Your lord is merely a regional administrator benefiting from his fringe location on the outskirts of the empire. What right does he have to name chieftains to become vassals of the Han? My lord Cao Cao represents the Han emperor in Xuchang. Now I'm going to gift your head back to your lord so he may know his place." Not wanting to offend either side, the Wu Huan chieftain quickly calmed both sides as he accepted Qian Zhao's offer and sent Han Zhong safely back to Gongsun Kang. And now as a vassal to Cao Cao, he would no longer be sending any reinforcements to Yuan Tan. And without these reinforcements, Yuan Tan's forces did not last long in Nanpi as it quickly fell. Trying to escape, Yuan Tan tossed his helmet and rode off on his horse. But this time, Cao Cao's army had a newly formed cavalry unit named the Tiger and Leopard Cavalry. And its name actually comes from two divisions within the unit, with the Tiger Cavalry being the Heavy Cavalry and the Leopard Cavalry being the Light Cavalry. So after a short pursuit, Yuan Han would fall off his horse out of fear as he tried to plead with his pursuers, promising them unimaginable wealth should they spare him. But before he could even finish this sentence, his head was rolling on the ground as the Tiger and Leopard Cavalry wasted no time and beheaded him. And with the city of Nanpi taken, Guo Tu was also captured and along with his entire family, executed, thus bringing an end to all those associated with Yuan Tan. Now before we move on to the last two Yuan brothers in the Yu province, we need to turn our attention back to Gao Gan in the Bin province, as shortly after he chased away Tian Zhao, Gao Gan also ended up surrendering to Cao Cao following the fall of Ye. But in a similar fashion to Yuan Tan's original surrender, he would end up betraying Cao Cao as Cao Cao advanced farther north, leaving behind a thinly defended city of Ye. However, Gao Gan's ploy did not get very far, as Yue Jin was able to lead a force that would chase him back to the Tong Pass, where the two sides would stall until Cao Cao would return with his full force in 206. Sensing that he was no match against Cao Cao's full force, Gao Gan fled. And after getting rejected when he tried to take shelter with the southern Xiongnu tribes, who are now faithfully surrendered to Cao Cao's forces after Zhong Yao and Ma Teng's coalition had wiped out Guo Yuan earlier in Hedong, Gao Gan decided to try his luck farther south as he attempted to take refuge with Liu Biao in the Jin province. But while he was sneaking south through Luoyang, Xia Hodun's forces would actually identify him as they would capture and execute him, spelling an end for Gao Gan and the Bin province. Now as a side note, Gao Gan did have a brother named Gao Rou, who ended up working for Cao Cao after all this mess, but Gao Gan for now is dead and the Bin province is now Cao Cao's as well. Now at this point, all that was left in the north is the Yu province. And with the writings on the wall, the loyalty of many of Yuan Shao's former generals started to sway, as not long after Yuan Shao had escaped to the Yu province and joined Yuan Xi, Yuan Xi's two top generals in Jiao Chu and Zhang Nan led the way as they would betray their lord Yuan Xi and essentially hand over the entire province to Cao Cao. Fortunately for the two Yuan brothers, they were able to escape once again, but with really nowhere to turn, they were left with one option, as only a few Wu Huan tribes still remembered how Yuan Shao treated them with kindness as three chieftains in Ta Dun, Lo Ban, and Neng Chen gathered their tribes together in the city of Liu Cheng to show their support to Yuan Shao and Yuan Xi. And for a time, a comeback actually seemed possible, as there were also hundreds of thousands of civilians who fled north as they treasured the time spent under the Yuan clan's rule and believed that Cao Cao's forces were here to exploit them. So in order to nip the bud before Yuan Shang and Yuan Xi can recover, Cao Cao would end up launching his final northern campaign at the start of 207, as he planned to march his armies all the way north deep into Wuhan territory to take out the city of Liu Cheng. And as he prepared for this campaign, Cao Cao would actually send out his advisor Dong Zhao to construct two serviceable roads along the eastern coastline to help support future military operations in 206. And when this was put into motion, 
there were quite a few within Cao Cao's court that were against launching this Wu Huan campaign. Shi Huan, in particular, was quite worried that risking an operation so far north would leave Xu Chang undermanned in case Liu Biao would lead an attack on them while Cao Cao was away. In addition, the Wu Huan tribes were known for their cavalry, and despite Cao Cao's recent efforts to expand his own cavalry units, with the establishment of elite units such as the Tiger and Leopard forces, matching the Wu Huan in a cavalry showdown carried considerable risk. And add on the fact that Yuan Shang and Yuan Xi are basically nomad refugees right now, and not really worth the trouble, they felt that it would be safer to abandon this campaign. But Guo Jia once again provided the accurate macro assessment as he believed the Wu Huan themselves also thinks that they would never venture that far north, so they would actually be unprepared. And considering how loyal they are to the Yuan clan, and the flood of Han refugees migrating north to join them, they have to bring an end to the Yuan clan once and for all to ensure future stability. As for Liu Biao, right now, Liu Bei actually wants to attack us. But Liu Bei does not trust Liu Bei, as he feels like he cannot control him. So he would never support Liu Bei's plan to attack Xu Chang, as the end result will end up benefiting Liu Bei much more than Liu Biao. While he would have to shoulder all the downside risk of a failed attack against us, therefore, this is the best time for us to attack the Wu Huan. And of course, Cao Cao would once again agree with Guo Jia, as he would prepare his army for the cavalry showdown. And for generals, Cao Cao would end up bringing with him either locals from the north or those who are experienced with cavalry warfare, namely Zhang Liao, Xu Huang, Zhang He, Zhang Xiu, Xuan Yufu, Yan Ruo, and Cao Chun. And for advisors, he would bring Tian Zhao, who had experience dealing with the Wuhan tribes as the lieutenant of Wuhan affairs, and of course, the mastermind of the whole operation, Guo Jia. And by May of 207, Cao Cao's army would arrive at the port city of Wu Zhong, or the modern day city of Tianjin, as he prepared to march north using the two roads built by Dong Zhao in the year prior. However, weather conditions would wipe out this plan, as continuous rainstorms during the summer seasons flooded the road, making it impossible for the army to continue north into Liaodong as the main forces were now stalled for over two months with no signs of improving conditions. So at this point, the Wuhan tribes and the Yuan brothers started to let their guards down as their scouts reported back that Cao Cao had placed guide signs along the road, informing his own supply units to halt future transports until after the winter season when the roads would become more suitable for military operations. However, they underestimated Cao Cao's determination and cunning as Cao Cao would seek the guidance of a local scholar named Tian Chou, who had previously worked under Liu Yu before his death, but then opted to become a hermit instead of working for Yuan Shao. And Tian Chou would actually inform Cao Cao that he knew of an old transport route through the Bai Langshan or the White Wolf mountain ranges that would take them straight to the flank of Liu Cheng, where even the Wu Huan tribes were not expected. Now, to be clear, Tian Chou did not favor Cao Cao over Yuan Shao by any means, as his desire to work in politics simply ended with the death of his former master Liu Yu. But after years of war in the north, Tian Chou just wanted the chaos to end. So even though Cao Cao tried to reward him handsomely after uniting the north, Tian Chou would be content to remain a simple court attendant in the imperial court, as he rejected most of his titles. So right now, under Tian Chou's guidance, Cao Cao decided to risk it all as he would abandon his supply units and infantry as he wanted to make a swift march across the mountains with just his cavalry unit carrying minimum supply with them. And by August, Cao Cao's forces, after around two weeks of forced march through the mountains, finally are only within 200 leagues of Liu Cheng but it is now that their luck would also run out as news of their position was finally scouted out by the Wuhan forces. But still caught off guard, the Wuhan chieftains quickly gathered up the force they had on hand, which amounted to over 10,000 riders as they rode into the White Wolf Mountains to find and halt Cao Cao's main forces. And find them they will, as these two forces, both completely unaware of the presence of each other, until they would literally bump into each other at a turn on the mountain passes of the White Wolf Mountain. At first, 
no one knew what to do, as both sides instinctively wanted to retreat. This was especially true on Cao Cao's side, as many officers felt that their plan of bringing only their cavalry carried immense risk as they were now heavily outnumbered and extremely limited in terms of their path of retreat. But almost right away, Zhang Liao rode up and offered to lead the assault as he believed from observing the Wuhan forces that they were equally unprepared for this fight and much of their formation is in a mess. And after studying the enemy army for a little bit, Cao Cao agreed as he would hand over his own commanding banner over to Zhang Liao for him to personally lead the charge. Then with Zhang Liao acting as the arrowhead, Cao Cao's cavalry unit plunged into the unprepared Wuhan forces. In the chaotic battle that followed, the Wuhan chieftain, Ta Dun, was slayed by Zhang Liao according to one account. Well, in a different account, it claimed that Cao Chun's tiger and leopard unit actually first captured him before executing him. But regardless of who dealt the final blow, Ta Dun would fall rather early on in this battle as over a dozen minor chieftains were also slain. And with their command structure destroyed, the disorganized Wuhan forces were routed. But also stuck in this narrow mountain range, they could not retreat as many riders were simply pushed off the side of the cliff as everyone rushed to run away from Cao Cao's forces. And by the end of battle, tens of thousands of bodies littered the mountainside as the three Wuhan tribes, totaling 200,000 tribe men together, including women and children, ended up surrendering to Cao Cao. But once again, the Lucky Yuan brothers would flee as they would leave Liu Cheng and run farther east towards Gong Sun Kang. And Liu Cheng was left to be massacred by Cao Cao as he wanted to send a message to those fleeing Han refugees who were avoiding him to join the Yuan brothers up north. And for a moment, Cao Cao wanted to continue the pursuit. But Guo Jia stopped him as he predicted that Gong Sun Kang will not dare to shelter the Yuan clan and will simply execute them and use their heads to prove his loyalty to Cao Cao in order to retain his rule of the Northeast for a few more years. And sure enough, Guo Jia was right again, as Gong Sun Kang had the Yuan brothers captured the moment they arrived, and when Yuan Shan asked for a chair, complaining that the floor was cold, Gong Sun Kang laughed and she said, a chair would be wasted on someone whose head is about to travel thousands of kilometers away, inferring that he had already made up his mind to execute both of them as a present to the new overlord of the north, Cao Cao. And soon, with Yuan brothers' heads in hand, Cao Cao's northern campaign is officially a wrap, as all four northern provinces are now under his control, while all three Yuan brothers are dead, as the glorious Yuan clan of Hunan is simply no more just seven years after Yuan Shao's failure at Guangdu. In addition to gaining the northern provinces, the unexpected crushing victory against the Wuhan also meant that Cao Cao was able to incorporate the best Wuhan cavalrymen into his army, as they would end up joining him on the return march back to Ye. But not everything went well, as these harsh mountain marches and cold weather in the far north proved to be tough on the health of many within Cao Cao's army. And following an extra wet summer season that flooded the eastern coast of Rhodes, by late autumn, the north entered into a prolonged drought where Cao Cao's army struggled to find fresh water for weeks on end as they were forced to slaughter their horses and drink their blood to sustain themselves. Eventually, the army would return, but many among them would perish, including Cao Cao's prize advisor Guo Jia, who had fallen ill during the initial mountain march and then turned for the worse during the drought. That year, Guo Jia was only 38. Also dying during this march back was Zhang Xiu, who had been instrumental in defeating Yuan Tan at Nanpi and had just been promoted to Marquis as Cao Cao granted him over 2,000 household worth of income, which was a record high at the time as it was only customary for Marquis to hold 1,000 household worth of income. And now with him dead, his son Zhang Quan would end up inheriting his title. But such was life during the Three Kingdoms, and when Cao Cao returned to Bohai, he would go on to write one of his more famous poems, Guan Tanghai, to express his emotions at the time, as uniting the North has cemented Cao Cao's legacy and set up the foundation necessary for the formation of the future Kingdom of Wei. And at the end of our lore series here, I'll leave you all with Cao Cao's poem, Guan Tanghai, 
or observing the Azure Sea. 东临碣石，以观沧海；水和淡淡，山岛耸峙；树木丛生，百草丰茂；秋风萧瑟，洪波涌起；日月之行，若出其中；星汉灿烂，若出其里；幸甚至哉，歌以咏志。Now, translating poetry is always a difficult task, but hopefully you enjoyed it. As Cao Cao, apart from being a very famous politician and general, was also a very well-known poet of his time. So it is always nice to have a chance to share some of his works, especially one so relevant to our story at hand. And with this, our Uniting the North lore series is officially over, as we have a very long finale episode here, and we'll return next week as we're going to be jumping ahead to Liu Bei's story of entering Shu. So I'll see you all then. Bye.